What I'll try to begin with is a uh, conceptual preamble of some of the things that set the stage for the current research and projects that we're doing. But really, this is a, an excuse to show the recent work, much of which is the result of highly particular cultural conditions, some of which are very compromised. Needless to say, a lot of the research and practice emerged through a negotiation between material and uh, digital cultures. Uh, myself emerging from a time when we drew out the parameters by hand, uh, often looking at uh, techniques and uh, um, methodologies that came outside of architecture, in this case, the sartorial trade. Uh, but also a critique or a challenge of dominant, uh, let's say, um, approaches to digital practices, uh, in this case Gary, where uh, an acknowledgement of the means and methods of fabrication was held in the unit of construction, but without any, uh, in a way, subordination to the syntax that a building may require, the turning of corners, the coping of buildings, uh, the relationship between space and surface, and some reciprocity between inside and the outside. So, um, in the earlier contributions, really, the agenda was to identify within the unit of construction, in this case a brick, the possibility that uh, structural, uh, environmental, and illumination possibilities are held within the logic of a single brick. The folding, the pleating, if you like, of the wall uh, gives it um, lateral stability. But it also reminds us that, you know, in architecture, drawing is not an illustrative process, but, but rather the act of fabrication itself. And maybe what was most important in this project for me was not the brick itself, but the notion that the mortar line, the 3 8 inch, uh, is a variable dimension. It can expand and contract. It's not a running bond or a Flemish bond. It's a variable bond. And that's what leads to the possibility of a, a parametric interpretation. And then subsequently, this was played out in a series of projects where we had to figure out the means and methods of fabrication, realizing that plans and sections don't get you anywhere. It's only with the advent of um, 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 being able to pin up the working drawing um, from the ceiling, uh, dropping the plumb bobs, and uh, establishing a price for that piece, which was about $30,000, about $180,000 less than what the contractor had bid. Um, subsequently, the translation of this very same technique in a much more complex project in China, uh, an art center uh, for which the first phase was built. In fact, and more interestingly, uh, here where the brickwork uh, is essentially a formwork for a concrete building uh, uh, in a seismic zone, but also using the uh, uh, variable potentials of that brick to vent out the mechanical systems below, to uh, deform the wall above, uh, creating the rake of the roof for, for drainage, and essentially establish a relationship between uh, the figure of the building and the configuration of the parts that make it. This reciprocity between uh, the configurative and the figurative will obviously come up again. This led to a kind of second order of discovery, and I don't want to present these projects in too much detail, but is that, that the notion that once in a while you will not get a stable figure of a unit with which to build. You have to invent it. And in designing the the gas station in uh, Los Angeles, we realize that much of it comes from a, a legacy and a history of, uh, of um, 
of architecture actually itself, some of it prefab, some of it uh, uh, cultured, but that there is a culture of gas stations and their branding is as important as, um, as um, uh, the architectural tradition that we bring to it. In this case though, with BP wanting to rebrand itself, we took the symbol of the Helios and from that extracted the idea that you could extend it up from a column to a capital to a canopy and using its distortions to accommodate for the zoning pressures and setbacks that were new, uh, compressing it to become a sign, expanding it to become uh, a space, all of which fulfilled the possibilities of a renovation of an existing structural system around which we had to form a new cladding. The cladding of the column, in fact, is identical to the pay station uh, and the signage, uh, all of which was an argument about creating an environment for the brand, uh, eradicating it of its, uh, of its traditional sign, if you like, and uh, uh, in a way establishing a relationship between the part and the whole. It's lighting systems, speaking, speaker systems, all somehow incorporated within a uh, tessellated figure that uh, ultimately required uh, uh, a subtitle in order for you to know what it is. Now extending this technique, and uh, we were commissioned for a competition in Beirut uh, whose context we found was uh, nature uh, and not so much architecture. It, it, it occurred at a moment when I had just come back from uh, Japan quite thrilled uh, with the discovery of Todd's uh, and the obvious relationship it establishes with nature. Only to be a slightly underwhelmed upon entry to realize that it's uh, in fact a classic modern building with a, if you like, a skin, uh, structural skin, uh, but that there is no reciprocity between the morphology of uh, the, the signifier on the outside and the arrangement of the building on the inside. In fact, it's a decorated shed of sorts. And so the, this competition, which was a bunch of little kids and then Zaha, uh, who was uh, an alumna of the school, we realized was no opportunity to really compete. So this is an opportunity to do exactly what we want to do, which was a, essentially an analysis of, of Todd's and uh, a kind of uh, relaunching of what it should have been. Uh, so the Islam Faris Institute, we knew before we began designing that we wanted the building to establish a dialogue with the very context in which it's in and effectively to disappear. The figure of the building was known to us way before we invented the configurative parts. The configurative parts then were exactly like the gas station. We knew that truncating a hexagon produces a triangle and this gives you a versatility to produce certain kinds of columns, uh, pilotis, uh, the idea of rotating it can transfer forces from one axis to another and produce something as generic as a, as a wall. So as a Instead of a brick, it's a, it's a, a geometric uh, volume can produce uh, conditions which can navigate the spatial variety of situations that orient themselves towards the Mediterranean, towards the downtown, towards the quad, and a variety of other arenas, which are heavy at the base and spatial, which probably end up doing their transfers in the middle and, of course, uh, lighten up at the top. The idea that the structure is no longer supporting the building but is part of the spatial armature of the building and is embedded in the program. Uh, techniques of course that deal and extend the, the traditions of the Gothic uh, are reinterpreted in Beirut, subsequently re-theorized in, in uh, France and then re-imported here in a building whose floor plans and its, uh, its slabs are uh, essentially di structural diaphragms and are really working uh, in a very animate way with the structural forces at work. Here, 
then a classic modern building here showing how a transfer beam works, uh, deepening its section. Uh, the cantilever, uh, as it, it, it gets embedded with certain programs, the auditorium, for instance, gets a raked edge and then the lightning of the top. The building effectively became a materialization of the very structural forces that um, uh, activate uh, a vertical organ organization based on a spiral plan that then uh, essentially orients, uh, orients itself to the entire site in many different directions. The main, let's say, moment of the building among others is uh, a moment of transfer where the uh, structural elements essentially navigate from one condition to another uh, from the auditorium up to the offices above. Here then there is no uh, classical separation between structure and skin and program. The attempt here is to embed the logics uh, uh, of, of all of these constituencies into a uh, uh, larger set of reciprocities. Obviously then there are there's more than one way to get at form. Uh, one is figural uh, and typological, if you like, in architecture. When I say basilica, you understand it has a cross plan. When I say rotunda, you know what I mean. But the majority of our research has been placed in the configurative, where somehow there's been a privileging of the parts that make up the whole. And in fact, when you do that, uh, you are freed and somehow liberated from that very figure because once you establish a, a genetic order, if you like, to the blades of grass, they may uh, emerge as uh, a variety of other uh, forms and morphologies based on other forces at work, uh, programmatic forces, uh, uh, illumination, whatever it may be. So now going uh, to the projects at hand, and you know, I'll I'm very apprehensive about this presentation. It's really the first time I'm giving it. So I do it with some caution. But the projects uh, now have far less control than the kinds of things we grounded ourselves in, let's say, the first 10 years of practice. Here, uh, in an Ordos plan called uh, 20 and 10, 20 Chinese architects and 10 uh, American or, or international architects, we were asked to be part of a business complex to do a series of office subdivisions, if you like. The uh, volumes of the office uh, towers or blocks were already predetermined. This is an area in China that is fueled by the economy of coal, uh, but nobody it's not clear to anybody who's going to occupy Ordos, who's going to work in it, and who's going to do what. Most curiously, the idea that uh, the towers uh, or the, the uh, office masses come to you as abstract volumes, not with cores, not with office arrangements, but with certain dimensional criteria that only permit very limited um, assemblages. So in fact, part of the major challenge for us was to determine, well, what is the nature of the organization uh, of these cubes? One of the most important things, for lack of a context, you're in the middle of a desert, for us was to establish in some kind of relationship to each other an idea of public space, extending what will eventually become a street into a public realm that uh, essentially is an argument about collectivity. At the same time, we understood that it is an office park and that the cars will need and require a front door. So some notion of giving a dual address that uh, is then further connected to each other was absolutely central to the idea of threshold and arrival. The diagonal then of this slab is really what defines uh, the plane between the under and the over and brings together the program. The volumes of the buildings then we adopted a technique, a well-known technique, whereby two volumes come together and in that connection, a link is made between two volumes. The idea of the expansion of a program. The idea of bullioning that intersection gave other possibilities also, bringing light into the buildings, 
but also giving urban passages that pass from the outside of the site to the inner plaza. So embedded in this idea was an imminently urbanistic notion. But somehow within that was a DNA uh, at the macro scale, at the urban scale, of different ways in which these volumes could be attached to each other. The most interesting of which is the, the kind of the axial on the oblique and the perpendicular to the oblique, uh, with this essentially creating a slab and that being two independent buildings. So with that in mind, we had really the challenge then of how these are able to uh, establish a relationship with their context, how you enter them, how you pass through them, how you bring light into them, and how you connect to the basement and the underbelly. The rest of it is pretty straightforward. The idea that the bullying and the cutting off of these volumes uh, essentially is an order that is brought to the buildings that is external to the logic of the very elements uh, that fabricate them. Within which, of course, there are the possibilities of some tweaking of the commercial office spaces inside, double height spaces that uh, acquire a kind of mm, uh, intermediary scale between the collective spaces of the outside and the office cubicles on the inside. The underbelly here connecting the garage level to the main plaza level. Now, what is interesting for me at the end is the way in which we eliminated uh, one of those uh, office uh, volumes, connected uh, all of the rest, and by doing so essentially create a single office building out of the five of them. By doing so, we also create essentially the possibility of multiple real estate uh, possibilities. The idea that one entity can occupy three buildings and another one the others. All five could be occupied differently or sectionally you may divide it up in different ways. The notion that somehow the parametric organization of the building establishes a very benign uh, real estate logic as part of its uh, layout. The way in which the subdivisions then begin to materialize themselves as a construction system is equally important because of the ways in which walls will probably have to be slammed into the facades at the intersection of a precast concrete panel system that um, alternates between solid and void, but then also gives you the potential to establish a direct link between the unit of construction and the overall mass of the building. The precast systems, of which I believe we did three, that can be reversed upside down, are then somehow aggregated uh, on top of each other, again, carved out to bring light to the double height spaces, intersected with neighboring volumes, again carved out for the urban passages that bring you through and effectively put into context or, if, or, or constructing a context uh, for the project. The part to whole relationship obviously is a central uh, preoccupation of, uh, of uh, uh, my interests. And, uh, and in this case, it is part of a very a stubborn program, something that does not uh, give you that much figurative freedom. Obviously, the relationship between um, program and, uh, and the figure has been spoken to in some detail historically. Uh, what I enjoy about the uh, little prince, or the diagram in the little prince, is, of course, that there's always a tension in the production of meaning, such that one always understands that there's a, an arbitrary relationship between the signifier and the signified, uh, which is why precisely one has multiple meaning, meanings embedded in, in, in objects. In um, Korea, the site of the next project, uh, we were faced with precisely this kind of opportunity and predicament. Uh, commissioned to do 
a uh, home gallery, essentially a model home gallery which houses model apartments that would be uh, part of a large development like this are embedded somehow in the upper black boxes of these spectacular buildings with essentially a glass base underneath all of them which is the payback uh, of what the developer gives back to the community in the form of amenities, uh, auditoria, uh, museum, galleries, uh, cafes, restaurants, and so forth. Uh, these buildings are a kind of phenomena uh, in Seoul. Uh, they are not uh, unique, they are everywhere. Uh, they are unique in the sense that they are, they in a way compete with the cultural uh, icons of museums, libraries, and other things but effectively they are a, a marketing ploy. But if I were to edit and extract out of it all of its fat, if you like, it would come down to uh, essentially two raw typologies, essentially a glass plinth uh, and uh, a black box above. And, and it remains for us to figure out how you negotiate any architectural surplus out of that. And given that this project comes at, after the economic downfall, it effectively doesn't even give you the same kinds of perks that the previous projects I showed you. What is interesting then about the site is the way in which it is located exactly in between a very urban condition on one side and a park, a public park that connects to the subway station on the other side. So invariably, it gives the site the possibility of creating a very pr the very promenade through the building and essentially put the building uh, smack on axis uh, in the promenade from the subway back into the city. It also gives the opportunity of essentially walking through but bringing the architecture down from above, effectively suspending the structure from above uh, along with the mechanical systems the lighting systems, the fire suppression systems, the, the architecture, if you like, of this building, uh, in a way, is a materialization of the program above, suspended into the lobby, a kind of hypostyle hall that um, shrink wraps, if you like, uh, all of the various systems uh, as they delicately touch the ground with the sidewalk material, the plaza material, the landscape literally flowing right through the building, and then making contact with certain significant elements, like the auditorium, which, whose proscenium opens out in, to have a hybrid relationship with the lobby. But the hypostyle hall, which has been changing over the last six months and continues to change today while it's in construction, uh, is literally like this. It's got uh, columns, but programs that keep changing. Even yesterday, that changed again, with a very thin structural skin on the outside. Um, it is essentially a, the idea of an open hall that you can walk through, uh, and every day uh, VIP rooms and uh, other sorts of multifunctional spaces keep changing as the auditorium essentially stays the same on that corner. But what is important then is also to develop an attitude about the skin that is absolutely porous and whose structure is not part of the logic of the building itself. In a way, making it as thin as possible and developing a system that uh, essentially can dematerialize as much as possible. And thus, we offer a kind of tension between the vertical organization of the base and the horizontal arrangement of the black box, which has only very few uh, openings for safety but not for views because those are internal environments almost more like casinos rather than anything else. The logic then of the structure is really based on a vertical set of T-beams as structure, um, also T-beams as mullions but also uh, fritting lines that organize a kind of barcoding that uh, essentially makes the whole base atectonic. We even take that all the way up to the crust of the, uh, of the roof, minimizing the tectonic expression of the building. And then, of course, it deals with the urban conditions of the corner, 
and various other relationships that uh, animate the base. The volume above in a very economical domino system needed to essentially truncate itself as a way of making volume or making figure uh, and producing that kind of tension for an object that needed to be seen in a very dynamic way from all perspectives. The base of the building then needs to establish a relationship with the landscape. The figures of both are somehow the materialization of the program in tension with that landscape. At once, uh, the program is embedded inside here, the offices, uh, inside that space, then dipping down into the hypostyle hall, then opening back up to the landscape, all of which is somehow an index, if you like, of the program while also speaking to the uh, skyline of both the hills and the, the buildings of, of Seoul. The top, then, is uh, essentially a series of horizontal striations, which were meant, if you like, to be... Uh, 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 solar collectors, but of course this is a project that from beginning to end is happening in less than one year. They didn't communicate us with us for two months and then yesterday we get an email and the whole thing is built. Um, but effectively they're following the plans and now we have a strict regimen of meetings set up for, you know, what we're going to do with this detail and that detail. So effectively there is a building and more or less uh, it is uh, conforming to uh, the, uh, the contract documents. But the landscape, and this is very much a project about the landscape, literally bringing the landscape through the building, but also fabricating a landscape, one uh, as in response to the skyline of the mountains, the other in contrast to the buildings uh, of Seoul. To set up two abstract systems in the most brutal sense of it. One, the tectonics of the base, the series of T-beams that land on the ground, create a kind of transparency, a fritting for uh, protecting against the sun, a roof that lands on it, compressing to the volume of the building above, but also to the program below. and its deformations and this distortions being the result of the rooms inside and the very few windows that it opens out to the landscape. Now, this connection to the landscape, and this is now a completely different context, a different price point, a different schedule, but is an opportunity to develop a house that's fully embedded in the landscape. Uh, similar to the previous one, but in this case, uh, a moment where architecture and landscape have a, a much more tight relationship to each other in the confines and in the context of a highly um, focused transformation of a building type, a very calculated building typology. It's a courtyard building that is on a distorted site, accommodating to the panoramic views on the one side and the focused views on the other, it is on the side of a hill overlooking the Mediterranean. And because of that, one section slips down to produce the view for the upper leg, while the roof of the upper leg keeps lifting up in order to face the upper portion of the site but in lifting itself up, it produces a kind of vortex, a hole that brings you up into the building um, from the entry level. It produces, if you like, two competing entries. One, a kind of front door, a formal door, but the other one, a kind of landscape loop that goes up through the house and into the landscape and then back down. So, at one level, the house is extremely simple, uh, the transformation of a courtyard typology, something that uh, would historically be indebted to interiority with the display section 
has the ability to protect itself from the context, the neighbors on either side with the upper wing, but also open itself up to the landscape below in relationship to the lower wing. The lower wing then houses not just bedrooms, but almost a dormitory style bedroom where anywhere up to seven to 20 people can get housed with the flexible living areas uh, uh, up above and a master suite on this side with a pool and the landscape that flow through it um, on, on the same level. The entry then is part of this sequence that takes you in from the car drop-off through the landscape with this swimming pool essentially to one side of it with views into it. Much of this house has a lot to do with the optics and the optical arrangement of the house in relationship to itself and the landscape. The upper wing then um, is uh, the main entry. You go up essentially uh, the main stair and essentially unveil the view only after uh, you pop through with the kind of horizontal expanse uh, of the Mediterranean in front of you and the, f and, and the pool as a foreground. If you like, it is a classic uh, modern building uh, which has this uh, uh, beautiful view uh, in front of it. Uh, the panoramic being on one side, but then more importantly, a distortion on the uphill side, which produces an interesting structural condition because it is now spanning, not in just in the short direction, but also in the long direction, producing uh, extraordinary views and oculi that look up to the Pinus Pinay on uh, the southern side. This, in fact, is the south bringing in southern light. The Pinus Pinay are part of the heritage of the site, and the house is delicately kind of carved around it, preserving them. Uh, and, uh, and the house is, is as much looking at them as it is looking at the various and discrete differences of each room uh, on its local context. The basement then, or the ground floor, is really where the dormitory takes advantage of uh, the separation of the bathrooms and the rooms so that each of these can be used in a more flexible fashion. Uh, depending on how many people are there. Again, the logic is, and the transformation is very much of a modern building where the ground uh, goes from the outside to the inside. Here, terracotta, bringing it down into the entry space and in fact, extending it into the corridor. Uh, the logic of the corridor then is that it borrows somehow the materiality of its neighboring spaces to striate and effectively give meaning to the experience of the corridor. But maybe the most important thing here is the structural moment that enables this entire building to occur. The line of the pool is the very armature that contains the pool on one side, but also contains the structural armature for the entire cantilever of this building. Behind that tile wall where the tile of the pool essentially leaks into the bathroom is that retaining wall that structures essentially the organization of the entire house. That line then of the retaining wall then comes up such that you actually have to climb from the bedroom through that wall into a lounge area on the opposite side. and. Um, the uh, landscape then essentially grows over uh, the building on all sides. There's a vast landscape agenda, which is probably not interesting for this presentation, but suffice it to say that it is a building that is very much embedded in the logic of the landscape, and the idea is to create rooms uh, in the building, but also outside of the building that can create terraces from which you can see over into the landscape. Now, I don't know if it's the result of value engineering that has happened to me in the last 10 years or a sublimation of the fact that I 
can't pass the structural exam, but most of my <laughs> experiments in architecture have been really focused on mechanical and structural areas, and this is no uh, exception to that rule. But effectively, the, the, the idea that the staircase is, is really the, the, the formwork for the very form of the house, but it, uh, is also the structural moment that launches the cantilever is as important for me as the idea of the re retaining wall of the swing pool being the armature that gives you the, 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 the pitch of that roof. These forms of reciprocities are very much at stake in the kind of, uh, of work that we're doing. Two animations that I'm not showing as part of that house, but I think is important to describe. Uh, one which really sets the stage for a different kind of thinking in concrete than in aggregative processes. When you're building in brick or wood, you know, you stack or you layer material and it's clear what you're dealing with tectonically. But concrete effectively is a liquid medium. So there's a totally arbitrary relationship between form and image. So you can use wood siding, pour the, uh, pour the concrete, and then you peel the wood off and it looks like wood siding. Or you can uh, lay a brick wall, pour the concrete, take the brick wall off, and you essentially get brick patterning. So we understand that it's an innate um, part of concrete that there is a kind of divorce between, let's say, form and content. But that's not to say that concrete is not always already made up of aggregates. At the end, what is concrete? It is aggregates that are at a minuscule level, sometimes not so minuscule, they're larger, and that that, once, once poured, becomes part of the impression of that surface. The notion that these two competing paradigms may come together to produce the tectonics of that house is something that I'm, I'm working on right now. Going back to structure, part of the research I did at uh, Georgia Tech was with that, and it was my fascination that structural systems, innovative as they are, uh, vector active structural systems, form active and surface active, have produced extraordinary circumstances for architecture, but never yet have they been attempted to fuse together topologically. The structural typologies always remain intact. We are not uh, surprised intuitively when water freezes and becomes uh, ice or snow or steam. We have a kind of innate understanding that nature does certain transformative things, and yet architecture is never asked to do that. So for the experiments of our structural systems at Georgia Tech, we needed to invent a parametric unit, a brick if you like, that could be manipulated on the x, y, and z axis to precisely uh, shift up and down and across to produce these different cells. Essentially, a, a box structure, a surface active structure, and you open its legs and you get a kind of vector active. These um, form the building blocks of what is the basis for an installation that has a stacked masonry system here, a laterally uh, a braced wall here, a truss that spans about 30 feet, and a cantilever that goes another 10 feet. Each of these uh, having a different relationship of part to whole. The part is constantly transforming in relationship to the whole, in, in relationship to the performance of the whole. And it is actually quite amazing that this structural system only displaced an inch and a half once we uh, let go of the formwork. That's, of course, pure luck. I won't claim it to be the part of any software that we worked with. But it became the basis for uh, the transformation of the Hinman Building, the School of Architecture, which was a commission that came a year or two after I left Georgia Tech. Now, this is a project also that is conceptually hinged around a high bay, an immense space of research uh, that was going to become the new hall where architecture and architectural research was to happen. But part of the key of this space was to recognize that part of its flexibility needed to come in the idea that the, the ground needed to be absolutely free so that you could move desks out, 
build huge installations, have the Beaux Arts ball there, uh, rearrange them for different studio scenarios, which really essentially meant that there was a tension between the vertical and the horizontal. The ground is a public space, it's a marketplace, and it's imminently flexible. The, the truss at the top is not only structure, but a kind of infrastructure, al along with the crane, that can hang a new studio, uh, a new staircase, uh, the lighting systems, and the entire infrastructure that in a way sponsors the activities below. In turn, uh, the base is then left flexible to interact with the galleries and the shops as well as the computer rooms and all of the other research rooms of the PhD, giving you a different kind of porosity on the ground. The structural system then literally hangs from the crane, repurposing it uh, years after it has not been used for anything else. And so it was very important for us to suspend this away from the structural system, not only for seismic reasons, but also for the purpose of levity and effectively uh, establish an architecture of suspension, uh, not even touching the structure to the ground, landing it on a table as a kind of mediator uh, to the ground. The same goes for the uh, spiral staircase, which is subsequently shrink-wrapped in mesh and lands on another piece of furniture. This led to the commission of the Melbourne School of Architecture located in the center of campus, an urban position between two very important quads, giving us the opportunity to create a huge public space, an interior space, which would house all of the flexible elements of a very stubborn studio building of architecture. Unlike here, where studio is uh, given in large, wide open spaces, there it's given in very small classrooms. So the central hall that connects the plaza on one side to the other side and creates that porosity is really an important vessel by which you bring very symbolic programs to the center. A studio space here, another studio space here, a crit space here. All of the things that can make out of this interior a unique uh, cabinet of curiosity, if you like. The void on the center, then, has three sponsors. A ground, which sponsors one studio, a uh, uh, coffered ceiling, which suspends another studio, and the Joseph Reed facade, an existing historical building that was arbitrarily placed there some 30 years ago, which is now sponsoring a third space on the interior. The ground is set up on a modular grid that builds up the locker systems for the students. The entire storage of the students is held around lockers all around the space as long as in this, pavi this pavilion. The pavilion is used not only as a, a social space but also as a kind of mock classroom for certain events that happen on the bleacher system that's embedded in it, but also becomes a large figure within the context of an, a monumental interior. At the same token, the ceiling is a structural coffer, bringing in southern light, which is northern to them, indirect light, from which is then suspended the very studio of the visiting critics, which are the, the key kind of symbolic elements. The structural system is then distorted with its max maximum moment being suspended down and just linked back to the balcony systems with a coffered system turning into a uh, surface system um, on the bottom side. And this is the Joseph Reed, Reed facade, which stubbornly faces the concrete lawn, the main public space of the school. Without a back, we had to invent its back, essentially shrink wrapping around the structural system and its windows, a new surface, indexing those very elements, connecting back to them and erecting out of them 
a new studio space that cantilevers out from that facade and essentially links it back into the building. Now, there are many themes, let's say, that we could discuss, and you have discussed a lot, and there are many elements and points that I've agreed with all day. But my focus then is gonna be on one or two very small points. And one of them has to do with a cultural dimension that is set up from the beginning as a profound contradiction and tension within the idea of tectonics. Everybody knows the example of the temple and the tension that is produced between the structural system and its ornamentation. We've all been taught that somehow the triglyphs are a petrification and materialization of the beams that extend out from the logic uh, of the building, which is, let's say, a moment of rationality and a moment of representation which is very simple to understand. At the moment that we perceive that same system turning the corner, we, real, we realize all of a sudden that there's a profound and deep crisis in, within the idea of tectonics because it produces suspicions on both sides. It either means that somehow the ornamental system is a superficial system uh, that is cast onto architecture but is inevitable, or that the ornamental system is in fact the central and prime agent of architecture making structure completely superfluous. But we know that this tension is always at work in all acts of architecture. And this is where uh, somehow notions of technology and representation between figuration and configuration are always playing this delicate dance between each other. Now, the more recent debates are between form uh, and performance, or representation and performance. Uh, some of you are old enough to know who this is. This is Burt Reynolds. At a moment in time when he was, you know, the hot uh, sex symbol of the 70s. At first you see a very handsome man, but if you look carefully, you realize that his hair is hovering just an inch over his head, which is the beginnings of a deep crisis that men have, which is called the comb over. <laughs> and the moment you witness the comb over, you can never ever recuperate. That's it. <laughs> now, some people persist, and you would think that this person is suffering from a condition of total denial, because they think that we think that this is all real hair and it's really all hair. But I don't think so. So my speculation is that this person fully is aware of their baldness by this point, but is dedicated to the acts and rigors and disciplines of geometry. At this point, this is all about how you construct geometry through linear filaments around a spherical object. <laughs> and we do that for a living. We do this all the time, you know? But in this negotiation between performance and representation, there's also the question of anticipation. What is to become? And certainly we know of those instances where <laughs> people are already anticipating either new, new uh, movements and new imageries and new symbols or the inevitability of their baldness in a few years. <laughs> now with all of the embedded disciplines that I've tried to bring to the relationship between figuration and configuration, I'll end on a project which breaks all of those rules we worked on this for eight months, developing a very rigorous geometric system and structural system made of tensegrity. Uh, they worked with us in Korea, in Guangzhou, to make it happen. And then somehow, uh, a week before they started building, they said, no, sorry, we can't do it. You have to redesign it, all out of compressive elements. But we said, well, you know, but a tensegrity's whole magic is about the relationship between uh, you know, the ten tensile and the compressive elements. You can't do that. They said, well, just see what you can do. Come back with all compressive elements in a week. So um, the analysis of the site image is very dumb and simple. Uh, 
is what's on the poster. The sidewalk that we were left with had uh, these trees and we had to work around them. It had all sorts of infrastructure underground, fire pipes, this, that, and the other thing, and we had to work around those too. Uh, we had to work within the setbacks of the sidewalk and the maximum general figure that we could occupy was that oval. The, we had to work with the voids in section of those trees, so essentially we also developed another oculus to bring light down into the center, essentially creating not so much an organization of the relationship between part and whole, but an index of two things. One, we developed architecturally speaking a formwork that they could build whatever inside, and the whatever inside was a diagram of when there are compressive forces, when there are transfer forces for the canopy, and when it can be the lightest. Essentially a diagram of the maximum moment, uh, the maximum lateral bracing, and all of that. And there was the security, uh, the fabricator is uh, a manufacturer of doorknobs and door handles, so what you're looking at, uh, each of these rods is a, is a door handle. Um, uh, the way in which the structural system was developed was in relationship to that formwork, as well as the discrete welding of elements until they kept shaking it and it stopped shaking. And in this mess, in this chaos, is in fact embedded some structural logic, a relationship with the ground where, in an acupunctural manner, you can just get to some kind of foundation. The idea of a loggia, whose relationship of column to ceiling is singular and differentiated only by the density of the rods, but not by architectural the, the classical architectural languages of elements that differentiate normatively. Thank you. <laughs>